sure you are be zany. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Achto the Hesed, surely your goodness and love. Yerdefuni Koyame Chayai will follow me all the days of my life. Veshafti Bevet Adonai Lurach Yamim. And I will dwell in the house of God forever. Amen. Today, with very heavy hearts, while we honor the memory and the life of our friend Larry Hildes, the Jewish tradition of which Larry was very proud to be a part of, provides us with a structure of how to mourn and how to support his loved ones at the sad time. All of us have lost, have lost loved ones, and so we know all too well the pain that Larry's family an extended family is feeling right now. We think of his parents, Barry and Susan, as well as his sisters, Liz and Audrey, and their families. I was able to spend time with them in this spot yesterday, and they're, pro they're probably joining us virtually right now. Let us not only pray for their healing, but may we also provide them comfort at this trying time. Though they're not physically present, there are many ways for us to reach out to them. I know that Larry, family feel supported by our presence today. Just as the Jewish tradition has a structure for mourning, so too does it have specific words of comfort that are traditionally recited at a funeral. Many of these words of comfort come from a collection from the Hebrew Bible known as the Book of Psalms. I'm going to recite Psalm 121. I don't think that is on your sheet, but it might be. But when I recite it, and if you know the melody, please join with me. I know that I'll be able to hear Larry's booming voice in my head singing along. As we all know, he loved to sing. Ezri meim Adonai Ose shamayim ve'aretz Ezri meim Adonai Ose shamayim ve'aretz Esayinai elchecharim Me'ayin me'ayin yavo Ezri Esayinai elchecharim I lift up my eyes to the mountains from where will my help come? My help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. And I will not let your foot slip. And our God who watches over you will neither slumber nor sleep. Our God watches over you and is your protection at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. Our God will keep us from all harm and will watch over your life. Our God will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. From Psalm 147. Ana Adonai harofei lish grelev um habesh la'ad smotam shalim nechumim la'avelim. O God, healer of the brokenhearted and binder of their wounds, grant consolation to those who mourn. Give them strength and courage in their time of grief and restore to them a sense of life's goodness. Fill them with reverence and love that they may serve you with a full heart and let them know peace. Amen. Amen. My friends, it's hard to believe that Larry is no longer with us in a physical sense. I mean, he had a presence when you shared any kind of space with him. As his rabbi for the past 10 years, 
I've had the pleasure of sharing many spaces with Larry, from a large sanctuary where we worshiped and sang together, to a classroom where we studied and argued Jewish texts together, to large gatherings in the community where we fought for the same issues, and to the ballpark where we rooted on our Bellingham Bells together. <laughs> there is no way you could be oblivious to Larry's presence. If he was singing, he was singing louder than anyone in the room. If he was arguing, you could feel his passion burning inside of him. And if you happened to be at a rally of some cause, he was cheering on the speakers until his voice would go hoarse. In all of these spaces that I've shared with Larry, one could sense that whatever he was engaged in, the fullness of his soul was in the moment. This is something I admired about Larry. I remember during my first year here, back in 2012 or 2013, Larry invited me to join him at an event at the Mount Baker Theater. It was a pro-marriage equality event. I had just delivered a sermon on the subject at the synagogue and realizing he had an ally in the cause, I tagged along with him and Karen. I vividly recall walking in the building and watching so many folks coming up to them in excitement. I wondered how they knew so many people. I can still see his arm around Karen with a huge smile the whole time as we heard speaker after speaker. I loved his passion. And as so many of you know, and I think we'll hear more about this passion in a little bit, Larry was passionate about fighting for and helping the underdog or giving a voice to the voiceless. I wondered about how this all came about because he was committed to fighting for human rights and other social justice causes, even if doing so was not always in his best interest financially. His father, Barry, was sharing a story the other day about how he changed allegiances in the 1950s from being a Yankees fan to an <laughs> Orioles fan after having just been the lowly St. Louis Browns. They were one of the worst teams in baseball at the time. But Larry, like his father, wanted to support them because of this. Larry found great joy in rooting for this club, especially when they weren't in contention. Some of Barry's best moments were with Larry at the ballpark. Now, Larry was drawn to supporting the underdogs in life. He himself was such an individual. Growing up wasn't so easy for Larry up through his teen years. And he witnessed firsthand what it felt like to be marginalized. Unlike others who may have sulked, Larry grew from these experiences and dedicated his whole career and life to ensuring that those who felt alienated or discriminated against had a fighter in their corner. He was relentless in his work. I know, about, I know how much he supported me when I spoke out on an issue we shared a passion for. He was always the first to say or write something expressing his gratitude. And I know how much he felt in my bringing the synagogue's teens to DC every few years to lobby elected officials on Capitol Hill. He expressed his pride in being part of a community in which he felt he had many kindred spirits. But to be honest with you, his greatest passion was Karen. Most of us know their origin story. He once shared it at one of Beth Israel's nights of storytelling events at the Mount Baker Theater. Reminiscing about their love together brought so much joy to Larry. But just to refresh your memories, in December of 1995, soon after Larry just passed the bar following his graduation from law school in San Francisco, he put an ad in the personal section of the newspaper in Berkeley. Karen answered it. This was the precursor to online dating. Their courtship blossomed immediately. At the time, Karen was writing her master's thesis in social work at Cal State Hayward. Soon after they began dating, Karen moved back home to West Virginia to spend time with her mother, and they just missed each other too much. The force of love between them brought them back together. Karen and Larry married in 2000 amidst the redwood trees in Marin County. Two years later, they arrived in Bellingham and this beautiful area has been their home ever since. Their relationship was so deep. She was his life partner and they worked so closely in their law practice. Not every couple can do what they did. 
Together as a team, they worked to support peace and environmental activists covering a broad range of issues and causes in Whatcom County. The two of them with their overflowing hearts touched the lives of so many people and were deeply admired for their commitment to peace and justice. When Karen died, a huge part of Larry died too. The grief he felt was palpable, but he had his huge support of friends, all of you and his family to rely on, as well as the synagogue's care committee who spent a lot of time with him over the years. The times I spent with him alone just before her passing or at Karen's bedside are some of the most meaningful moments I had the honor of sharing with Larry. As many of you know, it was a gargantuan effort to get him to leave her side so he could focus on himself. The two of them were as attached to one another as any couple could be. This is simply emblematic of his huge heart and a little bit of his stubbornness. <laughs> but everything he did for Karen, even if it wasn't something we may have chosen to do if placed in the same situation, was out of profound love he had for his soulmate. I may have disagreed with some of his choices, but I understood the motivations behind his decision. Karen meant the world to Larry. We're gonna miss them both dearly. In a couple of moments, we're gonna hear from a few of those who knew Larry very well. But first, I just wanna share some brief remarks written by some of his family members who I had the honor of getting to know this past week and who are currently not with us physically. This is from his sister, younger sister, Audrey Schechter. We are so proud of Larry for all he overcame and all he accomplished. His dedication to his work and clients, and to his family and friends, and to social justice was unmatched. We are so happy when he found his soulmate, Karen Weil, and celebrate their almost 20 years together. They worked together, worshiped together, traveled together, and celebrated life together. We hope in our hearts that they are together again. We'll miss him dearly and always hold him in our hearts. This is from his nieces, Emma and Grace Schechter. We love our Uncle Larry because he was always so joyful and genuine. Every time we spoke to him, he truly cared about everything going on in our lives. and was always our biggest supporter. One of our favorite memories of Uncle Larry was the time we shared together at our bat mitzvahs. He was so happy to sing and participate in the service, and he made our days even more special. We love and will miss Uncle Larry very, very much. And finally, from his nephew, Peyton DeWinter. I love my Uncle Larry because he was very thoughtful and kind. I always knew how much he loved me because when I saw him or talked with him on the phone, he seemed so happy to see me, to hear my voice, and to learn what I was interested in. Every year for my birthday, he and Aunt Karen would find out what book series I was reading so they could get me the latest release. He continued this tradition even after Aunt Karen passed away. I'm grateful for the times I was able to see and talk to him and I'll miss him very much. At this time, I'd like to invite Larry's friend, dear friend Ray, to speak at this time. Thank you. I am not Ray. I am Ray's surrogate here. Um, Ray is uh, in Tennessee. He was out here visiting Larry uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago and left uh, and then was unable to return at this time. So he asked me if I would read this for him and I am honored. I met Larry 37 years ago when he was a student in a dorm I directed at Northwestern University. Some computer gremlin put Larry, a liberal peace activist, in the same room with Bart, a Navy ROTC conservative. Their frank exchange of views, in quotes, often reached a very high decibel level. The loudest exchange involved Larry's aquarium. The sound of water being aerated kept Bart awake. Bart did not make the Navy his career he says in parentheses. The water did it. The water did it. Bart would turn off the aerating unit, which would anger Larry and push him very close to the edge of violence. <laughs> the solution that finally worked out was to move the aquarium to an unoccupied room. This constant battle led to three benefits for me. 
One, I sharpened my negotiating skills. Two, Bart made me his best man in his wedding. And three, Larry made me his best man in his wedding. <laughs> in the book of Proverbs, King Lamuel of Massa records the wisdom his mother taught him. The last verse in that section defines not only Larry's professional life, but the fact that it appears in sacred writings, it identifies the source of the divine fire in him. It reads, quote, speak for those unable to speak for themselves, speak for the poor and needy. It was my honor to counsel the only person I have ever met who fulfilled the counsel of Lamuel's mother so fully, so loudly, so persistently, so passionately, and so valiantly even while dying. And this was possible because of the divine fire in him given to him by God. Like the news commentator Eric Severide, I am pessimistic about tomorrow, but optimistic about the day after tomorrow. My pessimism comes because we do not have more people like Larry speaking for those with no voice. My optimism comes from a well-founded belief that Larry has passed on the divine fire to others. And that's from Ray Penn, his dear friend. I've got a fairly strong voice. I hope you can hear me. Please gather around if you need to. For those of you who knew Larry and Karen, you knew that you could set your watch by them. If they said they were going to be somewhere at 11.30 and they showed up, you knew it was 12.15. <laughs> so Larry and Karen's friends and fellow workers made sure that Larry was not late to his funeral today. <laughs> My name is Dave Tucker. I'm a delegate of the Industrial Workers of the World, the union that Larry belonged to. There are a lot of wobblies here today. I'm going to refer to Karen quite a number of times in my talk today because Karen was inseparable from Larry, except in death, and now they're reunited, and Karen was also a wobbly, so we have made a wreath for both of them. I met Larry Hildes and Karen Weil in 2014 at a Central Labor Council speaking event. I was wearing my bright red IWW shirt, and Larry, predictably enough, was wearing the ugliest, gaudiest, lime green, scream in your face, Troublemakers Union t-shirt. It was a magnetic attraction. We, at a pace slightly less than a run, converged on each other to find out who we were. Larry had been a member of the IWW in the 1990s, and when he left the Bay Area, there was no IWW branch here at the time for him to be part of, so he allowed his membership to lapse. I found Larry's paid-up union card in his room last night, and it's tucked into his shroud. Larry was a fighter for people who acted in their principles and who as a consequence of those principles were sometimes forced to break the law or were repressed by the law and the power structure for their principles. Larry, being a lawyer, took cases guided by his own principles. 
He provided skilled legal defense for people who stood up to pipeline companies and oil trains, who were targeted by police and military surveillance and infiltrators. He defended many people, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Larry became Leonard Peltier's attorney. Leonard, the American Indian movement warrior who was framed by the FBI for the deaths of two FBI agents on the Pine Ridge Reservation in 1975 and who has been America's best known political prisoner incarcerated since 1977. Larry was his lawyer at the time of his death. When Larry died, he was working on a somewhat different sort of a legal case. He was gathering legal documents to overturn the murder convictions of eight IWW class war prisoners who in 1919 sought to defend their union hall from an assault by goons who were supporting the interests of the Centralia Washington Commercial Association's capitalist interests, protecting their town from the rebel IWWs who were residents of that town. Larry embraced the progressive Jewish tradition of tikkun haolam, mend the earth. Larry had a strong view of what tikkun, mending haolam, the earth, meant. He knew that we must end capitalism with its inherent exploitation of the earth and its people and its concentration of wealth and power into fewer and fewer hands. Larry believed that capitalism cannot be reformed. He felt, like other members of the IWW gathered here and around the world, that capitalism must be replaced by a society where the working people who produce the wealth control the society and the economy and share in all the freedom and benefits and health care and education that such a society can provide for all of its members. For all this, Larry and Karen join the IWW. Back in 1990, Larry stopped at IWW headquarters in the Bay Area and took out an IWW membership card. Then, being Larry, he bummed a ride up to Mendocino County to join the Redwood Summer Campaign, being run jointly by Earth First and IWW organizers to save the giant redwood forests from profiteers and to try to find a way towards a more sustainable way to make a living for the timber mill workers, many of whom were involved in Redwood Summer. Larry worked with Judy Barry and other organizers. He didn't have a law degree yet but he already knew about labor law and civil rights. Larry and Karen were charter members of the Whatcom Skagit branch of the IWW. They became well known to some of our members, but many newer members here never got to know either of them as illness and misfortune overtook them both. And then COVID came along, and we were separated from each other, other than over tiny screens on our desks for the better part of a year. We lost Karen in March 2020. She lies right here. Larry was, wasn't on the scene much since then. Grief overcame Larry and many of us. So, Larry and Karen's friends, his admirers, and fellow workers are gathered here today. 
Our own sadness is tempered with the relief that Larry himself suffers no more. And again joins his beloved Karen. On behalf of Wobbly and rebel working people everywhere, I convey greetings of solidarity from the general administration of the IWW in profound appreciation of Larry's lifetime of work and sacrifice. Larry and Karen, rest in power. Larry and Karen, rest in power. Larry and Karen, rest in power. Thank you. So let's sing to Larry and Karen. We passed out some song sheets. They love music. And they love the old wobbly songs of Joe Hill. I know that Larry in particular liked Joe Hill's, perhaps his best known song, Preacher and the Slave, where he coined the term pie in the sky till you die. It may seem a little ironic to sing a Christian come to Jesus hymn today, but let's not forget this is a wobbly parody. It's a poke in the eye Larry Hildes style to those who promise pie in the sky while we live in the shit on earth. Wobblies, like Larry, wanted pie on earth. So everybody sing. Long-haired preachers come out every night Try to tell you what's wrong and what's right but when asked about something to eat, they will answer with voices so sweet. Here we go. You will eat by and by in that glorious land up in the sky. Work and pray, live on hay. You'll get pie in the sky when you die. It's alive. You will eat by and by when you've learned how to cook and how to fry. Chop some wood will do you good. And you'll eat in the sweet by and by. That's no lie. So I had the honor of meeting Larry j just about a year after Karen died. So Karen died uh, in 2020, uh, in March, right after the lockdown. Uh, I met him through the care committee of Congregation Beth Israel, and I reached out to him, cold called him, and he said, sure, come by. So that started my relationship with him. I met with him about three times in person, and we did about three uh, Zoom conversations. As you know, Larry liked to talk, and so um, it went on and on. So I wrote this a day after he passed away. I thought it would be a brief visit, but I ended up saying for more than an hour. He wanted the visit. While he struggled with all his medical issues, his cognition was clear and intact. He was the outgoing and extroverted Larry that I got to know. His speech was lively and animated. He was emphatic about his desire to live. Sophia's cat did her best to comfort him. He repeatedly massaged his scalp and commented that his barber was coming to give him a haircut. It was interesting in the beginning, you know, I had one, uh, one of the opportunities to meet with him in person, and he would go in and out of talking about his grief and still being very grief-stricken. But there were moments in between where it just really seemed he just got into a different way of thinking about it. And I got to know how he transcended his grief. Obviously, he didn't lose, you know, the, their union together, but he was able to talk about her in, in all the ways that they grew together, both, you know, in, in their union and their marriage and their, and their legal team. 
he said that um, his work as a, an attorney um, was, uh, she had such a great influence and, and they really throughout the time together, they worked as a team. My name is uh, Scott Slava and I'm a longtime <coughs> friend of Larry's and I'm gonna close with a few thoughts um, and then um, Rabbi will say, uh, finish this the ceremony. Uh, describing Karen and Larry is a little like um, five people in a dark room with an elephant, and where you touch is what you see. Larry was a very complicated man, and so I wanted to share a very subjective um, reflection on the last few weeks, if you will, of his life. Um, and that's what these notes are. So I'm going to stick fairly closely to them. Louder. It's hard to talk about Larry without bringing in Karen, but I'll try. To do that, I'd like to talk about one thing that I know to be true from our time with Larry, and it is that Larry approached cooking food, which he loved to do, exactly the way he approached life. It was always, always, something entirely unique to Larry. His cooking was also delicious, complex, over the top at times, but nuanced with the richness of complex spices and synonymous with hope, as this little anecdote, I hope, shows. You see, Larry, just as in his life, never went by a recipe. Never. He just sort of winged it cooking intuitively, actually, grabbing an ingredient because it sounded good, and this one because he remembered that tasted good, and that one over there, and a little bit too much of this one. But in the end, it was almost always really delicious and uniquely Larry, which is to say that it was never repeatable even by Larry. I had an ample opportunity to learn about Larry's love of food and his approach to cooking because Larry and Karen were part of so many, many, many family gatherings over the years, and so many of them involved cooking. We shared almost all holidays in one manner or another. They were always there for birthdays, celebrations, both theirs and ours, graduations, mornings of the death of a pet, celebrating spring, traveling on short trips to the island or Canada or the peninsula. They were always there with their big hearts, and I will say with their very complicated understanding of time, <laughs> which I won't go into here. And through it all, food was central to everything. One of the tra uh, traditions was around Thanksgiving, which of course we're seeing in a couple of days, where Larry would always make the dressing for the turkey. A month or so before this th the Thanksgiving, we discussed this Thanksgiving, we discussed Thanksgiving plans with him, and he was excited to do the dressing again. At that point, it seemed doable since he was still getting out, working, taking care of himself. But we could sense that he was fading very quickly. And shortly after we made these plans, he received his diagnosis that one side of his heart was failing and things were far worse than previously thought. Larry, as you can understand, was devastated, but the Thanksgiving dressing commitment quickly became a sort of language of hope between us. We were going to make that Thanksgiving. And then after Thanksgiving, there would be Hanukkah and Christmas and a new year. He could beat this thing yet. But it turned out the deterioration of his health began to accelerate. And so I started working out the details with him of how we could still make it happen. We agreed that on the day before Thanksgiving, which would be tomorrow, he would order the things he needed for the dressing that he could get delivered to his home. And then I would pick up the things that he couldn't get delivered. And then I would bring them over and I would 
on, on Wednesday, and then I would help him cook it up. By the following week, however, this would have been the second week of November probably, it was apparent that he was getting weak enough that he might not be able to get even in and out of the car or make it up the stairs to our house. So it was then we planned to have the hotel help him get into the car, and then when he got to our house, Dave and I were going to help him get up the stairs and into the house, and then at, we'd have Thanksgiving, and at the end of the day, we'd reverse the process and get him back home. Well, that was the way things stood a week ago. La a week ago Sunday. Liz and Audrey arrived on Tuesday of last week, I believe, and I went over last Thursday to visit Larry and the two of them. He was in bed, and he'd been, hadn't been out of bed all day. He was very weak, and he was in a lot of pain at that point, and he was struggling to stay awake. But there, beside the door, as you came into the apartment, were the groceries he'd ordered for the dressing. Liz and Audrey told me that he was still very hopeful about being able to make Thanksgiving, but he'd thought Thanksgiving was last Thursday. So he'd hustled up hardly able to get out of bed, he'd gotten those groceries there, got the, his part done, had them delivered to the door, and there they sat. That's the language of hope. Larry passed away less than 36 hours after that. Saturday morning, 3.30 in the morning, with his family around, and we were so glad that they could all be there at that time. So, next day, it's Sunday afternoon, and I'm staring into the trunk of our car at the bags of groceries that I picked up from Larry's apartment. We'd gone over there. And among them are the groceries that were going to be the ingredients for Larry's special dressing. The ingredients we he ordered last Wednesday. In those bags were all the traditional stuffing ingredients, like breadcrumbs, chicken stock, seasonings. And then there were things like water chestnuts and pine nuts and garlic and sage. But that's where the similarities between ordinary stuffing and Larry's smoked oyster stuffing Whoa. parted. Moroccan preserved lemons, organic Korean buckwheat soba, I had to write all these down, black truffle oil, clam juice, and of course smoked oysters, just to name a few. I don't know how to make turkey dressing with these things. I don't have a clue where to begin, right? But Larry could. So this year at Thanksgiving, we will have an empty plate. At our table in honor of Larry, in recognition of the sadness at his passing and in the joy at remembering what he brought to our lives and our community, especially our family. And this year's turkey dressing will be something plain out of my mom's Betty Crocker cookbook or Trader Joe's which won't be bad, but it won't have anything of the taste, the color, the nuance, and spirit that Larry brought to all the things he cooked up. Continue with the blessing called El Male Rachamim. El Male Rachamim, Shochen Bam Romim, Hamse Menucha Nechonak, Al Kanfei Chashina, Vemagale Kiroshim El Churim, Kazohar Harach. Amen.
God full of mercy who dwells in the heights, provide a sure rest upon the divine presence wings within the range of the holy, pure and glorious, whose shining resembles the sky to the soul of Larry Hildes. Therefore, Adonai our God will protect him forever from behind the hiding of his wings and will tie his soul with the rope of life. The everlasting is his heritage and he shall rest peacefully upon this lying place. And let's say, Amen. We continue with the Mourner's Kaddish, which is on your handout. We say this in loving honor and in memory of, of Larry. Before we do, let's just take a, a moment to reflect on Larry's <clears throat> impact that he had on, on all of our lives. If you know this blessing, please say it with me. If not, saying amen at the end, it's as if you said it yourself. Amen. <laughs> It barach, vish de bach, vit paar, vit roman, vit nasse. Vita dar, vita le, vita la, shmeid kudsha, brihu. Le ela min ko birchata, vishirata. Tush bechata, vinehemata. Damiran, belma, vimru, amen. Yehe shlama rabba, min shemaya. Vachaim, alenu, vel ko israel, vimru, amen. O se shalom, bimramav. Hu ya se shalom. Alenu vel ko Israel, vimru, amen. O se shalom bim romav, uya se shalom alenu, ve al ko Israel, ve imeru, ve imeru, amen. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom. Shalom Aleinu ve'al ko Yisrael Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom Shalom Aleinu ve'al ko Yisrael Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom Shalom Aleinu ve'al ko Yisrael Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom Shalom Aleinu Ve'al Ko Yisrael Ve'imeru Ve'imeru Amen My friend, there's a mitzvah called Kavod Hamet, honoring the deceased. This is the ultimate mitzvah that you can perform for someone because there's no way for them to reciprocate. We lay our loved ones to rest. Who else ought to do this? but Larry's community. And so we come to this harsh reality of loss as we each take part in placing earth over Larry's final resting place. I ask that we simply take handfuls of earth and sprinkle them over Larry. Once we have all partaken of this sacred mitzvah, the service will be over. You may then go in peace. Thank you for honoring the life of Larry Hildes today with your presence. And finally, may this gathering today bring comfort, most especially to Larry's parents, Barry and Susan, and his sisters, Audrey, Audrey and Liz, his family, and to all of us. Amen.